And believe it or not, there is something of an actual logic to our um, uh, curricula here. And the plan today is to build on some of the modeling aspects we did yesterday and some of the intervention aspects we did before and move to sort of the in silico um, uh, sort of model um, that's truly from the ground up. So we had you know, network model based simulations that Carter presented yesterday and um, uh, Scott and David also presented some of those with Sienna or REMS. Um, and when those are fundamentally, you know, sort of data grounded. And um, what I'm gonna talk about today, oh, I have the wrong slide up. What I'm gonna talk about today are um, simulations where you know very little about the actual real world and you're making things up whole cloth. So this is, um, uh, this is my, my joke is, this is when it's the one time in your career that it's good to make up data. Um, you just need to do it in a systematic way and be honest about it. And so what the plan is, is to talk through a bit of what simulation and agent-based models can do for you, how they work, how you set them up, and then go through a couple of detailed examples that are, are literally, that are currently in progress. Um, uh, just as a way to sort of show you the, you know, the scars, warts, and all, so you can see sort of, you know, sort of the way these things kind of um, get developed. Um, so, uh, the, um, from a program standpoint today, uh, we will end around um, noon or so, and let me just double check here. Yeah, so the last session, we're, we're scheduled to go through till one o'clock, um, but we have a bunch of time essentially there, about an hour for Q&A, um, which is really just designed to be an open set. Um, after I get done, we'll talk with um, uh, Sam Jenis, is gonna speak on EpiModel, which is a, um, a disease diffusion specific um, model that integrates Ergrim with the kind of agent-based models I'm gonna talk about. Um, and then hopefully Peter Cho and Jesse Lin, oh, there, Peter's right there, there we are, perfect. <laughs> um, they are, are going to um, uh, tell us a bit about wearables, um, sort of in the spirit of the last um, uh, series of lunch talks, though a bit earlier, given that we're ending earlier, um, to think about new ways to collect data. And it's really exciting to have them here because um, I think this is, though the data they're collecting is not specifically network data, um, I think you'll immediately see the relevance to the kind of work we've been talking about all week and hopefully the potential to collect network data with these kinds of devices in the future. So, so that's the plan for today. Um, it's a bit um, uh, less um, uh, packed than yesterday was. Congratulations to those who made it through yesterday. Um, and there we go. All right, so uh, I already said that. So um, we're, this is effectively what we're gonna do. Um, and I'll just start. So. This is a good thing to make up data. Simulations run a gamut from simple randomizations through to predictions. Um, so you'll often use simula... I, I find that simulations are a great way to help you... Let me be clear. I should back up. I'm, I'm hyped up on ca caffeine and puppies from already this morning. So, um, so what I mean by simulations are that you sit down at your computer and you write down a bit of code that implements a set of ideas about a social process that you have. Right, so literally, it's the instantiation of your theory of the world in a machine. And so the, there's a bunch of, of tasks you have to do to get there. But then there's essentially that, that notion of writing down on the world you know, the, a, a detailed version of what you think is happening, and then adding noise to it in a smart way. And so um, once you have that set up, what you've created is a very simplified version of the world that you can run experiments on. And so this is why we do it after models and after experiments, because what you're gonna do is essentially run experiments um, uh, on us in a simulated world. So why do this? Um, oftentimes you do it because you, have, you don't have the data, right? So there are things you would like to know about the world that just don't exist, right? You can't go out and get the data you want at the level of the social mechanism you care about. So if I'm interested in social exchange and trust, for example, I have a bunch of surveys on how much people trust, but I don't have their day-to-day -day interactions to see how they behave when they actually are engaged in a market or trying to you know, pick a friend or something. Oftentimes, we're interested in unethical treatment effects. We would like to do things that you just couldn't do, either ethically or um, politically, in the real world. So, for example, um, uh, we know we can stop the spread of COVID if we would just lock everybody in their house, or if we would make people stop having sex for about six months, we could get rid of the vast majority of HIV and STDs, certainly the bacterial ones, right? So um, we could do that um, sort of intellectually, but practically you could never do that, right? So it's, a, it's an impossible thing to do and wouldn't be ethical even if you could do it, right? Um, so there's all these things, but what's nice about these, these things is that if you can imagine what would happen if you did it, it helps give you a bound of what the range of the world looks like. So it helps you imagine what would occur in the world when you're, when you're trying to do something. 
So those are sort of the practical versions. And when you see the lack of data and ethical treatment sides, these tend to be simulations that are more tightly um, linked to the, to, the, to the real empirical world. So there's an empirical case like disease diffusion that you care about. The other reason you do theory is to, or you do simulations is to extend theory. We often have theories about the way the world works, something that tells us that what we think people do. And what a simulation is, right, beyond anything else, especially an agent-based simulation model like I'm going to talk about next, agent-based models are just your theory routinized. And the reason I say it's routinized is that anybody who spent any time in front of a machine coding things up knows that it's the computer does exactly what you tell it to do, right? And you can't get it to do something, or you can get it to do a lot of things you don't want it to do, but it's, you're, it's doing exactly what you told it to do. And that's the, that's the advantage and the disadvantage. And so it lets you get at things that you might not understand um, from your theory just by writing it down, particularly if you're the kind of person who, who can't look at an equation and say, oh yeah, that implies a peak over here and a double hump at the end or something like this. And so your ability to intuit log odds or differential equations isn't great, so maybe you can just simulate something and see what in fact happens when it happens. So there's a lot of work you do for that side. Um, the, the, the really nice thing for it is that it lets you see some of these emergent properties that come out of a system that's otherwise very simple. So if you have a process that people are engaged in, and that process is you know, at its you know, or at individual level pretty, you know, pretty innocuous or pretty simple, you can ask how it scales when everybody does it. And so um, I refer to this as the Kantian moment of, um, you know, of, of social science. They, they, Kant had this, mo mo this, this notion of ethics that I will my, my actions universal. That's what you get to do in the simulation. You can will the actions of your agents universal. And you can say, if everyone behaved this way, or you know, along a spectrum of ways, what would happen? And that's, an, that's something, again, you can't see. The other thing that allows you to do, and this was, um, so the disentangle otherwise conflated processes um, is the, exactly with the knockout, knock-in experiments kind of idea that um, uh, Carter was talking about yesterday. The, the, the reason these tend to matter is because most social processes that we care out, particularly in networks, have feedback processes and, and um, spillover effects. So whatever I do affects the agents next to me. And whatever they do then comes back on me. So you end up with this cyclic process of feedback, which is an, an inherent endogeneity, which gives the econometricians nightmares, but is actually the bread and butter of what we do. right? And so this is um, the way to actually get around that. You can also do a lot of stuff um, uh, that are, are purely methodological. And so if you want to figure out you know, if your estimates are unbiased, or, or, or so there's a lot of simulations you'll do just to figure out if you're getting the, if a method you've invented gets the answer you want. So all of those things on community detection I showed the other day aren't there. I think there's a lot of work you can do with sample design and construction um, uh, to save yourself some time. So if you can figure out like what kind of sample would I have to draw to get the coverage I want. There's a great property in networks called the network covering problem. If you want to figure out which set of nodes you have to sample in order to capture all the edges in the network. Well, you can simulate that on networks that look like yours and get a sense of what kind of sample you would have to do to design, for example. All right. So why do you want? So I think that if you want to think about what you're going to do, you need to jump into this um, uh, and uh, and really ask yourself, um, you know, so why you're engaged in this process. And so um, I, I think Carter said it really nicely yesterday. It's like, what answer do you want to get out of this at the end of the day? What's the thing you want to be able to do? And so you, what you don't want to do is say, I want to simulate the world, right? So I, I want a map of the world at the scale of reality is not useful, right? You need a map of the world that is smaller than reality and more simplified so that you can draw, so you can see the big picture. And that's the same thing with simulations. And so you need to figure out what, what exactly it is you want to simulate. And is it gonna be a guide to policy? So you're gonna to try to tell a practitioner that they should engage in practice X if something else happens, or are you just trying to push the theory so you can figure out where that goes? There's a data versus theory version of this. So how much does the question depend on what's actually occurring in the empirical world, like in the range of things you see, versus what would occur in a wider range that's not improbable, right? Do you really care that cities have buildings that can't be moved and that only certain houses come for sale? Or do you want to think about the kind of you know, results that emerge when people make choices without those constraints? And I think this sort of brings us to this realism question, which is, um, do you want to focus in on a single detail of something or all of the sort of warts and bumps and bruises that have to do with the, re the real setting you're dealing with? Um, for those of you that have ever done an agent-based model or been in the room when people discuss agent-based models, 
what, what typically happens is you'll go in front of a group that you're sort of consulting with or what have you, and they'll say, you know, I want to simulate you know, income inequality in a city. And they say, okay, I can do that. Let's imagine people get jobs. Let's imagine they fired, get fired from jobs. Let's imagine there's a distribution of skill, things like this. And they say, yes, yes, but I also want to add neighborhoods, and I want to add gender, and I want to add dental coverage, and I want to know how old their kids are. And before you know it, you have this entire array of thousands and thousands of parameters, most of which probably don't matter, and most of which you don't have a theory for, but it's going to be really, really accurate. Um, uh, Lisa Keister, who's um, not able to make it here today, but she used to work for a, a simulation te team called, um, uh, uh, called CoreSim. It was out of um, Cornell. It was simulating um, uh, essentially age and income trajectories, age, income, and wealth trajectories for the Social Security Administration. And um, the level of detail that the Social Security Administration wanted was mind-blowing. I mean, they actually wanted dental records built into the simulation because they figured that there might be like, crises that people have when they have to get crowns or something. And so it was like this level of detail is, can, can really get out of hand. So you need to think very carefully about what you want. So that sort of raises, I think, sort of the basic field of, of agent-based models. You can, I put the entire world to me as a two-by-two, two, so you can think of this as a space, right? And so you can have this realism prediction sort of axis versus an illustration and toy, and then you can have theory-based versus database, and then agent-based models will all fit in this space somewhere. So if you wanted a really realistic um, uh, you know, database simulation, you might do something like Corsa, right? You might be trying to... Um, you know, really figure out what the population distribution is today, what the birth rates are today, what their savings rates are, and then you push that forward. And you spend a huge amount of time in these kinds of simulations aligning your model. And so I want to make sure that the model for 1950 does a good job of predicting what happened in 1960 and 1970 and so forth. And you, you build in the kind of projections you need to make sure that each of these things are aligned with reality as best as you can so that when you then go off to present out of sample, you're close to it. The real problem with this kind of model is, is all the work goes into that kind of alignment. And you're still never guaranteed out of sample prediction, and there's overfitting problems, and it's, it's a, this is a, there's a defined art in doing these kinds of things. At the other corner, you end up with um, purely theory-based illustration kind of models. And here you have things where you're just trying to learn something about a process. So I'll set up something that has nothing to do with reality, per se. So I'll put people on a grid or on a circle or on a line, and I'll ask them to make choices about their neighbors. Well, these, they are just literally empty boxes that make choices. That's all they do. They don't have an age. They don't have a, you know, there's nothing else to them. But they do things. And then I can ask, and what I'm really doing there is I'm asking a question about um, you know, the, the result of this kind of toy act action. And so there's a bunch of different sort of things in between, right? I think that a lot of the stuff that ends up being more illustration, but we really care about prediction are things like traffic simulations, because you rarely put this on you know, the 405. Instead, you build a, a, a network of roads that has a certain pattern you care about that may not be real, but then you let the traffic do something that's real. So you have intersections, and you change the shape of intersections, and so forth. Um, so. Um, so that's, I just want you to keep that in the back of the mind because I'm going to dig into some details. Most of my work sort of bridges um, uh, really sort of down here. Um, I spend a lot of time in the sort of more theory illustration side, a little bit up in this world, but even sort of my COVID work on this um, has been, the work we've done has been you know, not trying to, to capture reality exactly. It's been more trying to illustrate a theoretical point. All right, so let's start then with some ideas about what you have to do if you want to set up one of these models. So um, I think that every agent-based model effectively has three parts. And so the first part is the environment. This is the thing, the setting where your agent acts. Right? And so this usually consists of a series of features that either constrain the action of your agents or it um, uh, provides resources that those agents get. And so that's the, 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 the role that the environment plays. It provides a, a constraint on the things, a constraint on a resource base upon which agents can move. In our setting, um, uh, that environment is often a network, right? It's often an underlying network of associations or friendships or you know, sexual contacts or something, and that um, determines where things like disease spread or something. Um, but there's lots of different versions of this, and so an in by id grid on a shelling model, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. And there's a space, you can have a, a there's a, a classic model called Sugarscape, 
where you th just drop a little bit of um, bits on a, on a landscape and these ants move around on it, right? And so you could think about that. The third part, is which people tend to get all the attention on, um, uh, are the, sort of these next two. Though I think that we, under, we underplay the importance of the environment, but I'll come back to that in a bit. But um, the next set, of course, is you need, if you're going to have an agent-based model, you need to have agents. Agents are the, are the critters in your model that do something. Right? And so they buy a house, or they move, or they pass a disease, or they get old and die. Right? So there's all kinds of things that your agents do. And the question is, you have to figure out what it is you want your agents to do, and what's relevant for your agents to do. Right? So if I'm doing a shelling housing segregation model, I don't need my agents to exercise in the morning. That's irrelevant for that simulation. Um, so just think about what it is you think you need your agents to do, and um, really be careful about the kind of characteristics that they have. So effectively, whatever agents do, you're going to have to build a, a little holding object to, um, you know, to car carry those. You're going to have the race or whatever you've ever done. Agents enact rules. And so there are rules at multiple levels. There are system level rules and agent rules. Agent rules govern how agents behave in the model. And the way these models work is that it, you have some kind of a temporal unfolding. And at each step, an agent engages with their environment or their neighbors, and they do something based on a set of rules that you write. And this is where most of your theorizing probably comes. And so you need to figure out what rule you have that guides what the agents do. And the classic example that's almost entirely rules, um, in the, the actual structure tends to be um, uh, predetermined, is something like the prisoner's dilemma exchange. Um, as it started, these, there's a whole branch of these that Axelrod and such did. Um, in these models, you have you know, what rule do I play to cooperate or defect? Do I, um, it, you know, do I do tit for tat? I do what you do back to you. Um, uh, do I play Queen's Gambit, I think is the name of it? Um, uh, where, you know, as soon as you cross me, I damn you forever, right? Um, uh, so there's a bunch of different models that you can play, and you might say, well, which one wins, right? It might be that being a jerk right out of the gate is the best thing to do. Well, you can, uh, you can the experiment in those kinds of Axelrod models, we're really asking, there are different theories that we can encode as different rules, and if we put agents together in an environment where they're playing pairwise games with each other, what happens? Then you have a global processing rule. And there are two parts of the global processing rule. One is essentially how long do things happen, right? So essentially do things occur? Do we do a one-shot exchange? Do we do an infinite exchange? Do the agents know how long the simulation is going to end? Things like this. Um, and then there's a microprocessing rule. It's like do all the agents exchange simultaneously? Like do, are, we, is, is, are you trying to simulate actual parallel processing? Or do people work sequentially? Um, and this is, and they, they, these can have these can have important effects on the result that you, you're trying to get to, so you want to make sure that you think through those as you go. So I'm going to start with the classic example of this. This is the, the down in that toy corner, toy illustration corner. This is known as the Schelling segregation model. And in the Schelling segregation model, Schelling was an economist in the, I think he wrote this in the late 50s, early 60s, something like this. Um, I should have a site up there, but I don't. Um, and so in this case, um, what we have is our agents are, I'm going to call them people. Um, uh, the negative people call them turtles. The agents are boxes. Right? These are, are voxels on the, machine, on the machine. And you can be either red or blue. That's what you can be. The environment is just a 50-50 grid. This is some kind of an analog to a city. That's the thinking here, that there's something about this space that we can think of, because we want to let our agents move from one part of the city to the next depending on how happy they are. And so in this case, it's a 50-50 grid. It's not actually a 50-50 grid. It's a 50-50 cell space, but it's a, it's a torus. So this side is linked to this side. This side is linked to this side. And so if an agent moves, this agent's neighbors are these people around it and those three up there. So it's all wrapped around itself in a, in a set. Um, in this case, I've um, set up the environment to be pretty dense. You'll notice there's very few empty squares, right? And so that's, a, that's an element that you might not think of in something like a, a, a model like this. Um, but if I'm going to have a model that says that people have to move around, there needs to be a space for them to move to, right? So there has to be some empty space where the place locks up, because I can't live with somebody else. So that's my rules. And so the rule sets said, if some proportion of your neighbors are the same color as you, I'm a, then you move. If more than that percent are, your, um, uh, are the same color as you, you stay. And so it's a very simple threshold model. And so the, um, uh, the process says that uh, the, the process that, sh that Schelling was trying to capture in a toy sense 
is this notion of people fleeing um, uh, the inner city in the 60s um, uh, or, or some other sort of, you know, sort of feature to, to get people that are racially homophobic. So it might be that I would like to have, if I'm a white person, I want to have white neighbors. If I'm a black person, I want to have black neighbors. And so if I find that there are black people moving into my neighborhood, I run away. That's the kind of model they're saying. And so what he wants to say is what kind of segregation at the city level are you going to see when people have different levels of tolerance for neighbors that are dislike them? And so in this case, we say that people want to have at least 70% of their neighbors like them and, 30, and that they're willing to have 30% of their neighbors that are different from them. And if that's the case, um, uh, then they're happy. If not, they leave. Notice it's not the amount of happiness. It's just a binary. You're either happy or not. Okay? And, it's, and moving is costless. So, so there's a bunch of things about this model that, you, that are not there. So you run this model. And what happens is you see you get a bunch of these completely homogenous sets. And so despite the fact that people are willing to have neighbors that are different than them, in practice, what that, what that very simple rule set leads to are these pure homogenous tracks where people are all the same. Right? And so most of these people in this network end up, or in this setting end up having neighbors that are 100% of them are just like themselves, even though they're willing to have 70% of the people that are, that are like themselves. Right, they want to have 30, at least 30% of people who are like themselves. I turn that around. I turn that around. Now, if I set up the exact same set of rules, but I leave more open spaces, what happens? So, that you had, so notice I've, I've changed the environment in this case. I've just changed the number from 246 to 2,000, I'm not, you know, from 21 to 24 agents. Keep the same set of rules, and what do we see? Right, you end up with roughly the same kind of set, um, uh, maybe perhaps a slightly bigger set, but notice that people that have no neighbors around them are happy because it's really a model that says, I want to have people that are like me. I want to not have people that are different from me next to me. And so that model then means that you end up with some sort of these big open sort of spaces. We can do the same thing again. And now I set it to a 50-50 threshold. You get bigger, denser sets, and so forth. And you can play a bunch of these games. And so it's a, it's a it was, the takeaway that Schelling and others have taken from this model is that people can be quite tolerant, right? They only want a little bit of in-group preference. And the emergent property of this game is that you end up with highly system-level segregation, even though people are willing to have local-level integration. And so it's a, it, it suggests, then, that if you're going to, um, you, you know, these kind of tipping points are nonlinear. That's the, that's the way these models work out. All right. So there are other sort of elements you need to think about when you build these models. Um, so one is you need to think about the, um, uh, these, these update rules. And so do you update parallel versus serial? In this one, this classic shelling model, each agent makes a decision one at a time. So you're, you're, you're moving through the, spa the state space of you know, each agent um, uh, at one time, at, at a discrete time ticks. And at each time tick, you randomly select a person and you have them look around and whether they're happy or not, and they move. The next time step, you run so it's one person making a choice each time. And that creates the, the and that's a, in some sense a necessity of this model, because other, if we moved in parallel, otherwise two people could try to move to the same spot, and you'd need a rule for who gets to win that spot. Right? So it's, a very, it's much simpler to do it this way where you have people move at one at a time. If you do a, some, a parallel update, it means that e there's a, the state of the system at the top of your iteration. Every agent goes through and makes their decision based on what's going on around them. They implement their decision, and then you update the environment for every agent. And so this is that everybody's acting simultaneously, as opposed to sequentially. And, we're, and it, in many ways, that's, that's reflective of the world we live in, right? In many settings. I'm, when I'm up here speaking, Carter's getting coffee, and those things happen at the same time. And I don't have to wait. He doesn't have to wait for me to stop speaking in order for him to get coffee or vice versa. And so we could imagine that this kind of parallel feature works well in the, in the setting. But you need to be careful, right? You need to figure out whether or not your setting works that way. If you're doing radio traffic in the World Trade Center, then it might actually make sense to have things work in real time and have the simulation work you know, in discrete steps where only one agent can talk at a time because radios otherwise talk over each other, right? So you can imagine working on these things. In terms, the, the kinds of differences that you get is that um, uh, whenever your rule set depends crucially on agents reacting to the environment, um, sequential um, unfolding tends to, cre tends to create smoother outcomes because effectively you have much tinier changes on the margin. What happens when everyone decides simultaneously 
is you get a lot, uh, it take, it didn't, the models can take a lot longer to converge, and they can converge on somewhat weird spaces because people are constantly adjusting to go past each other, right? And so no one gets happy because they're all moving simultaneously. So you get lots and lots of noise. In practice, um, I've, I mean, these things are literally just where do you put the update in the for loop? So it's, it's just as easy to do one as the other. If you have a really massive system where you're doing lots of changes um, uh, you know, on a big scale, um, uh, then the parallel version actually allows you to parallelize in a way that you can't do if you're doing truly serial, um, but that's usually a trivial bit. All right. The other update rule is do you do a fixed or random update? So notice the way I described the shelling model as implemented in the Negapi case there is that each agent is picked at random. Right? That means that some agents might never get picked and other agents might get picked many, many times. Right? Alternatively, what you can do is say, I'm going to go for each time step, go through each person, and do X. Right? And so then in that case, each person gets a sequential order. You can either do it in a fixed order from person number one to person number N, or a randomized order from person, you know, just randomly pick one or the other. I recommend doing randomized order. That sort of seems to me that the order of your nodes initially should not ever matter for anything we do. Um, but, you know, I could probably be convinced that there's another reason to do it. Um, if you're doing a serial update and you're always updating people in the same order, then that's a feature of your environment, right? So that's something that's part of your simulation that's baked into the, what you think the reality is. And maybe that's true, right? Maybe if you have a pecking order, the big gorilla always gets to eat first. And that's true every day, and that's a resource allocation feature, and that's something you add to the model, and that's perfectly reasonable. Um, if you don't know that, then randomizing probably makes more sense. Um, the other sort of feature of your environment that you have are these update rules. So what happens to your population? Do you have a population that turns over, or do you have the same set of nodes that, that set? This is usually a, um, a generalizability kind of question. So what are you trying to infer to from your model? Um, when I do disease simulation models of something like COVID, I'm willing to take the assumption that I'm dealing with a fixed population. Well, some people can die, but I'm not going to let new people into the population. I, don't, I figure I don't need, a, for a, a disease that's going to run maybe three years, I don't need to get that kind of a level of realism in for, for the kinds of questions I want to ask. Now, if instead you really do care about the ways in which population turnover matter, if you're doing the kind of simulations that Ashton was talking about with kinship structures, then your population needs to update. When people die, other people need to get born. Right? That's part of the process. If you have an inheritance model where you're trying to figure out how inequality spreads through generations, then you need the new people to enter the, the generations, and you need rules for updating those, those, those sets. Um, and that can actually get quite complicated, right? So um, if you're trying to figure out birth and death rates of your agents, you need some rules for each of those steps. You need an allocation of people to partners and things like this. And so it, it quickly spirals into lots of things to do. Um, population, yes, is this, that's what this note is. Um, yeah, so just be careful that the distributions you get, um, one of the things that happens, um, you know, classic sort of you know, first time error, like you sit down and you just, you write up your simulation and you have a really good model for how the age at which people have babies and so forth. But you started all of your population at, you know, with 20 year olds. And you start all your population with 20 year olds, they all have babies at the same time, they all age at the same time, they all die at the same time, and your population does this, right, all the way down the thing. You don't want that, right? So think carefully about like where you into the process, how you burn into the process, these kinds of things. All right. The big sort of nitpicky part of this pro of any agent-based modeling project is figuring out what the values of your parameters are and the number of parameters you need to have. Um, most simulations have a set of um, control parameters, things that guide the action, um, and they have um, some number of substantive par parameters. And I, I'm just putting this up really to be a, um, uh, I think, for, particularly for non-data-based simulations, you want as few parameters as you can reasonably get away with with your theory, right? The more parameters you add, all you're doing is creating complexity for yourself. Now, your system might require complexity. If it does, great. That's a feature, not a bug. But if you're just adding parameters because you think it might matter, and I have sort of this notion that in reality, people have different ages, and so I'm gonna add people of different ages to my model, even though I don't have a theory about how age does anything in my model, then it, that's probably a mistake. And again, this becomes more of a problem the more sort of you move along this realism line, people will push you to add parameters or variables that describe what people do or who they are. 
Um, and I'll give you some examples of that in a second. The other sort of feature is we often don't have a natural scale on the value of parameters, right? So for something like a shelling model, I have the proportion of my neighbors. So that's a reasonable, I can think about what that means. But um, oftentimes I want to say, you know, I'm going to take the advice of my friends versus the advice of my parents. What scale is that on? All right, so you need some way to think very carefully about how you tune these parameters to be comparable to some decision you want to make. The final point, I think this is the final point. No, of course it's not. I have to keep going. Um, <laughs> you need to think about what, what it is you're simulating. And for networks in particular, we tend to have simulations on networks or simulations of networks, or as um, uh, Sam's going to talk about both. On networks tends to be the, the simplest of these two, right? And so what you end up doing is saying something is moving across the network, some diffusion or idea or beliefs or something. Um, and so you spend all of your time with the rules, you can treat the network itself as fixed. And that's a, that's a huge win from an uh, implementation standpoint. It's a lot easier to change the state of the actors than it is to re rewire the state of the network in many, many times. And so the efforts in these kinds of, of, of effects tend to be focusing on the agent rules. Now, you're not, you don't necessarily have a static network in this case. Like I could have a fixed dynamic network, or I can have a, a level of something that's changing, but it's not changing as part of the agent rules. It's a scheduled change or something I know that occurred in the past. Simulation of networks um, is a lot of the work that we talked about yesterday um, in terms of um, these sort of knock-in, knock-out experiments. What kind of um, uh, structure do you get? But we can have, I like to think of largely these two sorts, right? So you have exogenous networks where you build the network based on some kind of feature, and then maybe that feature changes, like a belief structure or political beliefs, and then people rewire their networks. And so that ends up starting exogenous, we have some characters to go through, and then it works in on itself as to something changes in the network. And um, you can do this, um, uh, so that now one of the nice things about both um, uh, Ergoms and Sienna models is you can simulate networks from rule sets based on those, and that's a nice way to generate a family of networks. But you might have something more um, sort of, uh, you know, exchange-based or something where your theory is about how people change networks. So I just want to be, you know, so those can often be times where you just write those rules for yourself. And a classic example, is social balance. If you think of the friend of a friend as a friend, or my enemy's enemy is my friend models that Craig was talking about on day two, like those models can be put into sequences in real simulations. You can put a bunch of people in the network, you can see different kinds of distributions of friends and enemies, and you can say, let's play the rules and see what happens. And it turns out that it's not as always easy to get to the final equilibrium solution as you think it might be because people move past each other. And so there's, you can learn some things from those models um, uh, quite nicely. Often, so if you're doing both, um, uh, then you um, uh, want to make sure that um, uh, you have the, again, just, it, just make sure that your, your rules are guiding um, uh, what you're doing. Um, all right, some perhaps non-obvious cautionary points uh, that I want to throw out there. These are, um, uh, the, another, another sort of title for this slide would be mistakes I made that you don't need to make um, uh, when you're writing, is make sure you have some, uh, whenever you're doing network simulations, things can build on themselves in really ways that you might not have built into your simulation to start with. As if you're not careful what you're doing, you can do um, uh, some pretty silly things. So um, degree constraints, for example. So um, does the setting you're modeling come with any activity strengths? Um, it probably does if it's a social network. People only have so much time in the world. But if you have a model that says a friend of a friend should be a friend, it's really easy for that model to say you should be friends with everyone. And so ask yourself if that's what you want. And if it is what you want, great. If it's not what you want, ask yourself how you want people to trim their friends. Do you want them to, like, is it a replacement model? Is it a, a time we spent together model or something like that? All right, so one quick solution, of course, is you can just fix degree and focus on changing the other side. That's a pretty heavy-handed one, as we talked about yesterday. But it, it might be the best solution if there's something else that you really care about doing. I, th I think a, a lot of times in the simulation world, we don't think much about agent memory. Um, we tend to, um, uh, as, as human critters, we live in a world that's, that's, that's rich with meaning, and we all have memories that are either more or less accurate of the things we've done in the past. But in simulation land, we tend to just have a Markov chain. So whatever the state is at time t, that affects the network at time t plus 1, and everything that happened at t minus 20 just doesn't matter anymore. So imagine a shelling model, right? I mean, what the shelling model does is people are just jostling around, they're moving the space, and I'm happy to move back into a house that I moved out of. Most of us in the real world would never do that. Like Once I leave in a house, it's dead to me. I don't go back there, right? Because whoever I sold it to screwed it up, and so I don't ever want to see it again. Um, 
And so you know, maybe that would matter for the model, maybe it doesn't, right? And so you want to think for yourself whether or not your agents have memory and what that implies. The reason that most of our simulations don't have memory is that um, it's expensive to carry that memory, right? Because if you have a series of interactions with other people, you need a structure to store that um, a series of interactions, and you need a, a sequence that goes with that. Um, a nice sort of simplifying solution is to sum things with some kind of a moving window, right? So you can make it possible that I um, uh, you know, remember the last K iterations of things that I've done or the, the sum of those iterations or the result of those kinds of features, but just make it clear. This came, um, you know, this came up when people, on the, some of this work we did on romantic relations. It's, um, uh, if, if you break up a romantic relation, you're very unlikely to go back to that relation. It's not that it never happens in the real world, but the reason that people inherit friends in the divorce is that they, those people don't want to deal with each other anymore. And so this notion that a breakup is a one-way street is a constraint, that's a memory constraint on the edge. And so you want to think carefully about how that's built into your network. It's also possible to get runaway configurations, so feedback processes and models that can easily walk into spaces of the world that are just truly what you um, didn't understand or intend. That's usually informative, like that's usually actually a signal, not noise, and so it says you programmed something in your theory that you thought you operationalized right, that either you operationalized right and meant something entirely different than you thought it did, or you didn't program what you thought you were programming. And so spend some time very careful, one of the, what, this, what this really says is these runaway configuration models is to really, th uh, ideas that when you could have something occur that you really wanna make sure what you're doing is, is realistic to within the bounds of your theory. The classic example of this is that there's a reason that the peer influence model, um, uh, the rows of the W matrix sum to one. They sum to one because then the idea space never gets out of the bounds of the original um, uh, distribution of the range of the ideas that were, were there. If I allow my friends to not just average their uh, ties, but add to their ties, then all of a sudden, um, uh, my Y values in that peer influence model can sort of go off into crazy parts of the space. And so I can end up having people you know, driven to high extremes. Now maybe that's true, right? Maybe it's the case that a co-rumination and a bitching about politics kind of model actually has this amplification effect. And if so, great. Then to what extent? To what's the range? What does that mean? But think about it. And just be clear that you're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So in prior years, I've gone through some detailed examples. Um, uh, of the, uh, and these are just a list of those. If you go in, onto the, the DNAC website, you can pull up the prior slides and you'll see some of these features. Um, what I wanted to do now is talk about a couple of different uh, models that we were currently working on, just to give you some under the hood ideas about sort of the ways that some of these things might be implemented. Before I run to that, um, and then after doing that, I'll, I'll give you some implementation ideas um, and software sort of suggestions. Does that seem to work? All right. So let's talk about um, uh, one of my favorite examples, um, uh, which is a uh, uh, complex contagion. So uh, Damon Santola and, and Macy have this model that says for social goods moving through a network, it's not sufficient to treat it like a disease that one infected person kind of comes in contact with one susceptible person, but instead as active agents thinking about adopting something, I look around my network and I say if multiple people are using it, I'll adopt it. If multiple people are not using it, I won't adopt it. And it turns out that that can have some really interesting implications on the spread of things through the network. Um, and so if you imagine what that looks like, if at time one, this pair of people are connected, at time two, this one person could adopt, note that at time two, this person couldn't adopt. And that's because you need at least two of your neighbors and only one of their neighbors has adopted at this time. And so you end up having this tiling effect that the only way that things can spread through the network is if there's at least two edges on the network that it can go, at least initially, to get started off. Now, if one tile went this way and one tile went this way, it's possible that you get bridges across, but it requires in its initial spot to get this kind of tiling process to go. So we can ask, like, well, what, what does that actually imply on a set of observed relations if that's our rule? So, and it's a very simple simulation. You seed the, you seed the population with pairs of adopters who know what they're doing, and at each time step, their neighbors get the opportunity to adopt or not. And in this case, I was, the, the, the decision was just purely at the maximum. So if, I, if this is true, then I adopt. I don't, there's no coin flip or anything. It's a very simple walkthrough of the space. And we randomly picked two ties to start in order to get um, uh, this initial condition so that someone could have two ties to start from. Now, you could randomly start from anywhere with two pairs in the neighbors or multiple pairs, um, but we figured this would be a nice, easy way to start. 
So we start like this, and what happens, we find that the vast majority of time when you run this simulation, the thing dies out, right? So the proportion of people adopting the mode is just a couple more people than the ones you start with, right? And so a few people come in and say, look, we got these great new devices, come and use it with us, and then no one else does, right? So it dies out. But if it makes it past a certain level, then a many people adopt, right? So it has this kind of nice bimodal distribution where you end up with either no one adopting or everyone adopting. And it's, because of, and it's because of this threshold effect. Now, in reality, you're going to end up, you know, the, the, this everyone adopting is the absolute best scenario, right? Because it says that if two of, my, uh, two of my alters adopt, I then adopt. Not if two of my alters adopt, I have a probability of adopting. I guess it's really an, a, a, a high-end outcome. The setting matters for this outcome. So it turns out that the, um, the guiding, the strongest parameter in the model that governs um, whether or not um, the size of the ultimate number of people who adopt is the local transitivity ratio. And that's because that initial takeoff requires um, uh, uh, tiling in the, in the adoption process. Um, but the global structural cohesion, the number of, of independent paths in the network, conditions the effect of transitivity. So this is a nice emergent feature. And so this kind of pattern you don't see necessarily in something like disease diffusion, because in disease diffusion, it's easy to pass over these bridges, or it's easier to pass over those bridges. Right. The other kind of an, of an example of a simulation on a network is, oh, please, go ahead. Yeah, so the question was, um, if, I, if you don't know what the, the, the K on the Centola model is, what number do you pick? Um, uh, and the answer is, you, you have to just guess. You don't know. And so you can, you can guess empirically, so that's some of the work that Tom has done and others on um, adoption or diffusion. What we used to call adoption thresholds are actually a function of the number of your peers who adopted prior to you. And so you could use something, you can use his tools to estimate those kinds of models. But for a simulation feature like this, notice that K2 is the lowest possible K you could have, right? So it's the case that um, I'm ending up with just one more person than simple contagion. And even with just one more person than simple contagion, you end up with much lower threshold. And so again, this is why I refer to this as a toy model, because it's, I just wanted to learn actually what effect that would have and how it was conditioned by the network. If I wanted to so I try to sell to a company how to get their device out there, I would need many more parameters to figure out sort of those, just those kinds of issues, like how sensitive the population is and such. I had this idea oh, a few years back um, that many of, the, uh, many of the problems with things like this adoption or other sort of adoption of innovation stuff, they tend to be um, binary adoption features. So the idea is it's like a cell phone adoption or Betamax or something like this. You, it's a purchase. You buy it, you have it, you've adopted it. And then you try to convince other people you're cool and get them to adopt it too so you don't look like a weirdo. Um, but many of the things we care about in the world, um, and particularly our, our mental models, and I think most mental models need to be reinforced. They need to be, they need to be nurtured temporarily in order to, keep, to be sustained. And the classic example of this is something like a second language. If you, all, if you learned a second language at one point, you know, as long as you're practicing it and keeping doing it, you can keep speaking that second language. You go a few years and you don't speak it, and it's gone, right? So you need to reinforce it for a while. And so I said, I think I, you can conceptualize this as a diffusion model with forgetting, that I convince you know, someone of what's happening, and then once I do, like I need to, it decays over time. So I think, hey, this is great. Social networks and health are the best thing in the world. I can't wait to keep doing this. You go away for a week, you get distracted by someone else, something else happens and you forget about it and it sort of falls down. So let's imagine we have a process like this, right? And so we have a population of actors who are linked by network ties, and I use real networks, just observed networks. I don't think I was using Prosper or um, Ad Health, I don't recall which. Um, and so these agents represent people, and the rules are agents adopt a belief from their neighbors stochastically. So if, my, if I'm connected to someone who holds a belief, there's some probability that I do it. It's a, it ends up just, if you want to know, it's a random binomial draw based on the number of my neighbors that have the belief. Um, and in each T, the salience of these, these um, beliefs drops by some constant feature. So it's a very simple, and then once a belief goes below a threshold, you can't give it over again. And so the general rules are, I ask you adopt a belief, it's not just um, uh, the, it's the proportionate to, to, the weight is proportionate to the amount of belief in your local ego network. And so it takes the, if you're, 
if you're surrounded by a bunch of neighbors who weakly believe something, you're unlikely to talk about that because the logic of the model. So I'm using sequential spread, and I ran in a randomized order and a stop and rule implicit on the state. That is, when the disease or the idea is either held at a steady state or goes away, I stop, or after some number of iterations, I get tired and stop. Um, and so this is what it look, kind of looks like. Um, I took these three random, in this case, this is an example of, of where the set went. Um, you can have a, I characterize these networks by the amount of um, uh, average pairwise connectivity. So this is Moody's favorite um, uh, cohesion score. And say the really cohesive networks and less cohesive networks, we engage in this process and we ask, well, what's driving these different features? And under one set of parameters and one set of bits, you, get, you can see that there's a really strong conditioning effect of the number of independent cycles in the network. And so it's the case that in order to sustain a belief, you have to have these lots of little loops Right, or you don't have to, you can get one out here, but you're more likely to get a good sustained belief system in the entire setting if there are lots of different loops for people to, to talk about. And it's because you have a conversation about social networks health with one person and then later with another and later with another. Um, the, uh, uh, another example, this is social exchange with homophily. Um, I, I, as, as many of us, we've been thinking a lot in our department about, I mean, we've gotten a lot of talks and a lot of um, discussion of structural racism in our department. Um, not in our department, but in the world that our department is talking about. Um, and as a, as a you know, quantitatively inclined sociologist, a lot of this work is pretty frustrating because it tends to be very hand wavy, not really tied to anything. What's, what's meant by structure? Is it structure of the mind? Is it structure of the setting? Is it structure of history? Like what is actually there? Um, what's the measure of it? There's going to be really gross measures at the state level that are always endogenous. And so we're thinking, like, is there something about this that a network person can think of as structure that is fundamentally different than those models? And one idea is to, is to build off network exchange theory. And a very simple model of network exchange theory comes out of Wright, and Morgan. And Wright, and Morgan had this idea that if difference, that, that networks imply very different contact rates by group size. And so group size has a nonlinear effect on the extent to which something can flow through the network. And so I said, well, what would happen if we applied a Wright, Tina, and Morgan kind of model to a trust exchange game? And we said that people are engaged in the community. They're out there doing things with each other. And when they do things with each other, they're implicitly engaged in a trust and, a, and, a, and an exchange process. So if I trust you more, I'm more likely to have a successful interaction. If I trust you less, I'm going to have a less successful interaction. And so uh, we can implement this model. It's really, uh, this is the world's simplest game theory model. It's just a coin flip, right? So there's, no, there's really no strategy here. It just says, when I, my finger gets burned, I take it off the thing. That's all this model says. And so, um, but I put that model in a series of different kinds of environments and ask, what does it imply for these models? And this is, if it sounds familiar, this is exactly what Martina Morris and Jimmy Adams and I did with HIV exchange, um, uh, HIV spread um, by race groups. It's, your HIV is higher in uh, minority populations than it is in majority populations. And one explanation for that is that minority people are degenerates and they do all kinds of things that they shouldn't do. And if they would just behave themselves, it would be all different. But it turns out that if you, um, if you just look at the exchange patterns, and treat everyone so that they're having the exact same set of patterns, you still get massive inequalities and higher HIV and STD rates amongst minority populations because their mixing part of patterns are constrained. And the pool they're moving in creates greater numbers of loops and higher levels of natural concurrency, which then creates greater opportunity for disease to move. So you don't have to assume differences in people's propensities or behaviors to be you know, more or less promiscuous in order to get different levels of disease spread. And so the thinking is, can you apply that model to something like a general social exchange. In order to do so, we imagine that people have, play, have a very simple sort of reward structure. So there's a, a baseline sort of level to how much you trust the person from the other category that you're interacting with. So they, I've had a lot of experience that's been positive. I will trust them more. I've had experience um, uh, that has been bad, and I trust them less. And so this is a learning model. So each agent has this propensity that says, I start out at some baseline level of trust, where it's a coin. In this case, in this little example, it's a coin flip. And so if I flip that coin and I lose, I trust that person less, that kind of person less. If I flip that coin and win, I trust that kind of person more. A very simple model. We can then add to that a couple of different sort of ideas. Um, I, I couldn't help myself. I should have stopped there if I had followed my advice for having one single parameter, but let's, let's not. Um, uh, I couldn't do it. 
And so let's assume then that we break our population into in-groups and out-groups, right? And so what we have is an out-group bias. And so if they're in my group, right, so the zero, uh, a, a person of type zero exchanged with a zero, a one with a one, you have this upper curve. If you're, you trust other people from the out-group a little less. And so the difference in the way to the extent you, with you trust them is this little out-group bias gap. And so that's some parameter that you can set, which is the outgroup bias, and that parameter, um, you could set it for each different combination of groups. You're gonna see that I keep it the same for pairs, just for comparability. And then we also say that if there's a, really a learning model, then you don't like keep this schedule set. At some point, you get enough experience that the difference in the kind of person goes away. And so I have my initial sort of um, uh, preference that this happens this, but after enough experience with that person, it goes away and everybody treats the same. You don't need to do this. This is actually um, a, a conservative assumption in the model. If you keep the bias all the way through, it just exaggerates the results. But, um, so let's imagine a world, right, where everybody, you have two equal sized populations and everybody behaves exactly the same. You play, flip this coin. What you get are a bunch of random walks um, uh, through, the, through the, the wind space. Some people flip a lot of negative coins. They then trust less, and so the bias is to flip less and to flip more negatively, and sort of these are the curmudgeons that live in cabins in the woods by themselves and send out letter bombs. Um, or you end up over here, and you flip a coin, you keep flipping a coin at one, at one, at one, and all of a sudden out here, you think yourself Mark Cuban, and you sort of won the world, and everything is good, right? You are, you're a great entrepreneur. Um, it's all random walk. This is just coin flipping, right? But it's coin flipping with luck. And you'll notice something, of course, here, that in this case, this is our baseline. Everybody's effectively exactly the same, and there's really no difference. Um, in this particular case, the cumulative level, if you were to take all the people and add up the number of um, coins they've accumulated that were heads, you'll see that they end up having a nice positive growth. And that's because the system starts out with a greater than 50-50 chance. And so it's a, it's a positively biased random walk, and the parameters say that everything is, you trust people eventually if you win often enough. And so on average, most people do well, some people do better than others, you're always gonna get inequality out of these models, but there we go. Which is a different lesson sociologists should learn, but that's a rant for another time. All right, now let's assume that we have outgroup bias. Right? We still have equal sized groups, but we have an outgroup bias. So I trust my group better than I trust others. There's some bias that I add to these models. And in the in-group zeros, in-group ones, cross groups, you see this kind of a pattern. You see the same exact pattern we have from the last slide moving here, where the um, random walk is, pi is positive, but the um, cross group ties are, are negative. And so the more cross group ties you have, the more likely you are to fall. And, but because these are randomly sized groups, and they're equally sized groups, excuse me, that on average, people do the same, notice the inequality has gotten larger. Right? And so we've added more chances to lose in this model. And so the inequality overall goes well. One person got really unlucky. Right? So this is, this is an outlier case. There's a whole sort of story about um, uh, rare events. And that was a, an, an interesting rare sequence. It was driven by this really initial series of bad luck. Um, let's say you end up there. So now let's um, imagine then, so that the personal accumulation is a, you know, effectively the same. The, the, that variance is, is trivial. Now we're going to uh, try a different kind of model. What we're going to do here is we're going to say we have the exact same set of parameters, right? But we've just now shifted the size of the groups. And so now we have a majority and a minority, and we have majority to minority ties and minority to majority ties. And you'll notice, right, that these things are different sizes. Um, but the curves are exactly the same. There's no bias in, at all. You get positive. It's a positive random walk because that's where we start. And you end up seeing that kind of a set. Right? And you get nice positive accumulation. Now we do the exact same thing, and this time we do it where the, the outgroup bias is exactly the same. So majorities distrust minorities at exactly the same level as minorities distrust majorities. So I don't have to assume any kind of asymmetry or the behavior or what have you, and everybody trusts themselves exactly the same. So every person at the individual level acts exactly the same as every other person at the individual level. The only thing that's different here is the difference in group size. You play the game and you look at the pairwise exchange histories and you can see that they look, you know, about what you'd expect given those two numbers. And so you see what that looks like when you sum up within groups, you get a radical different outcome. We see that the majority wins most of the time and the minority loses most of the time. And that's because for each individual, the proportion of their within or cross group ties is structured by their opportunity to exchange within and across race. So in this case, you see that minorities 
the vast majority of their ties end up being with white people in this case, if you're, if you're black, whereas white people, they have only a minority of their ties with, with blacks. And so even though the trust levels and thus the expected return within cell are different, the fact that there are so many more of these ties from minorities than there are from majorities means that minorities lose. And this is a, I think this is a good example of what a, a real structural racism feature might look like. And we would see this in healthcare. Like if, I'm a, if we find that you're, you know, if you're a, a patient and a doctor, you have these kinds of distribution of set, your trust in the health system, if there's just a little bit of distrust, it magnifies more for the in-group than the out-group. And so this is just the box plots of where that goes. There's all kinds of different ways you can play this game. I don't, I, um, there's all types of ways that um, you can imagine what you have to do to fix it. And so if you were to imagine um, sort of the buy black movement, I'm going to say buy within your community, I'm going to ask you add some positive coefficient to the within group cell. Say, well, you got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. That coefficient has to be pretty big to make up for this difference. But it ends up having this kind of a model, that the curve you have for in-group and out-group ends up looking different depending on which set you are. But you can play that game, and you can do it um, in lots of different ways. And there are ways, then, what that ends up doing is it means the within-group ties have to be really, really positive. I can notice there are no orange lines coming out of here. So we have to have a really, bi a really biased in-group set in order to make sure that we can counteract that sort of preponderance of off-group. So that's just a, a, a one way of doing that. What's fun is um, Kieran Lelly, the guy who did the um, uh, Shiny app for uh, our um, uh, IdeaNet software that you saw the first day, did the same kind of thing with this model, mapping it to um, the, race, the, the racial distributions in each state using um, our Shiny um, uh, and our census. And so you can actually pick out for any given state and any given race um, combination um, a, a set of assumptions about how much they trust the in-group and out-group, and you can see what the differential return in that place might be. Right? So I think this would be one way of operationalizing that set. And I am already now at the end of where I'm supposed to be. I have a whole other thing here on disease spread that I didn't get time to get to, um, which is too bad because it's kind of fun, um, uh, but I won't talk about that now. In the slides, you'll see a set of um, parameters or a set of uh, guidance for uh, software that you can get. If you're just getting started in this world and want to play with something, NetLogo is great. Um, uh, it's a great place to learn these toys, um, and the coding language is really easy. You can just, it's, like, it's really easy to get under the hood, and, and the beauty is there's this whole sort of array of um, models they have that you can just modify, which is nice, and so it's there. Um, the, my complaint with NetLogo has always been it's just a toy. It's sort of you can play with it on your machine. Um, but now there is an R, Net Lo an R Net logo package that allows you to um, sort of wrap a toy into a wider set of experiments so you can then collect the results up and do things nicely. And that makes it a, a much more research-oriented tool than it used to be. Um, all right, a couple of other different um, uh, bits. I'd, I'll skip just in the interest of not stealing too much of Sam's time because his work is actually more important. But um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> My apologies for going too long. <laughs> Questions, comments, thoughts? Please. The question is, is there a handbook to go to of some sort um, to guide this work? There have been a bunch of them. Um, uh, and I think that uh, Carter alluded to um, a couple days ago, there was a big spate of these that came out in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, driven by Michael Macy and a few others in the social sciences. Um, and there's a couple of great um, annual review of sociology papers, for example, that have sort of picked up on um, simulations and agent-based models. Um, there, I'm sure there must be a handbook of agent-based models. I haven't, I haven't looked for it. Um, uh, the, the, the old sort of, sort of the, the equivalent of Wasserman and Faust in the agent-based world is um, uh, Simulating Artificial Societies is the title of the book. Um, and it's a great example of going through these features. And I'm just drawing a blank on his name. Um, you remember? Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll send it to the list and we have it. What's that? Not that? That's another good one. Uh, yeah, yeah, Joshua Epstein. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah.
remember the, I can't remember the, I can't remember the name to the authors of the old silver books. Yeah. They were um, fairly general textbooks on one simulation and social applications. Um, again, yeah, same era, the 90s era stuff. I think the field of this work has sort of bifurcated in a couple of different directions. Um, there's still those of us that play with the toy models to learn insights about um, uh, social processes. And then there's the consultant group that have um, been funded largely by DOD, um, uh, some by um, uh, uh, the, the big money sort of bank world. Um, and they're doing really detailed, you know, essentially war game simulations. Um, and those models, the, the place to do there is to find somebody at RTI or the um, uh, Biocomplexity Institute at um, Virginia um, to essentially talk with you. And they have those kinds of simulations. All right. Thank you, guys. Oh, please, one more question. So could you use this simulation model to join the Yes, that's a, I think that's a great reason to do these kinds of models. As you simulate something to say, this is what I would expect to happen when I go collect real data and test it.